Welcome to Offwatch, a podcast by the Ocean Race. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke to Emily Nagel, who did her first ocean race with the last edition on board Team Axinabel. She's been pretty busy since then, sailing on a variety of different boats. But most recently, she's been sailing on an Imoka 60. And as these boats are going to feature pretty heavily in the next edition of the race, I thought it would be a good idea to check in with her again after her ocean crossing to get an idea about the boats, the technology and what it takes to sail them well. Last time we spoke, um, you know, you'd obviously been out in the Med, you'd done some pretty cool sailing there. You were talking to us about how you were involved with, you know, Sail GP. Um, and obviously everything that you've done with the VO 65s in the last edition. But lately you've been out on one of these new fancy Amoka 60s. You've just done a, a transatlantic. So I was really keen to talk to you and get an idea. Um, What's the difference? You know, what's the major sort of standout difference? So, so talk us through from the beginning. You make your first step onto a 60. Everything in your mind, you are used to stepping on board a 65 day in, day out. So you step on board a 60, straight away, what strikes you? In general, they're just, they're just quite different because of they're not one design. So everything's open and suddenly, you know, you've got this whole branch of, you know, all of the mockers, you know, they've got the same general concept. They've all got the main kind of similarities. But, you know, when it comes to the foils and the general layout of the boat, everything is just super different. And there's, like, room for kind of constant change. So from day one, you know, we had the opportunity to just play with everything. And, you know, just the boat from when we left the dock to when we arrived in Newport was quite different just from know change of setup and then you know just trying to make it more aero here and there um the whole thing is just you know constantly trying to update the design and make it as fast as possible while with the 65 a lot of it is you know you've got to stick to the rules and have it how it's designed while this is like you just want to go fast so (laughs) so i mean that obviously lends a little bit of pressure to preparation time now. I mean, if you've got your 60 now, like you say, it, it's not going to be the end product that you're going to take to the start line. 65, you can rock up two months before the race and as long as you read the book on how to do it and you don't break anything, you'll you'll be okay. Exactly. Like right now is the time to be developing the 60s because, you know, time is money and the teams that are getting ready now are going to be on the front of the line. Like it's invaluable, like this time for foil testing, for testing different shapes, figuring out, you know, how to make the boat rip. Like the one thing with their mock is at the moment, um, with the Vonde is, you know, there is development and they're all testing new foil designs, but no one's really pushing the envelope too much. <laughs> like they know what works. They know what's fast. So they're not really going too outrageous with anything. But with the Volvo, like you've got, you know, it's still the same boat, but you've got this different opportunity where, you know, you've got more time. And because you've got more people on board, you can push the boat that bit harder. You can go for something a little more outrageous. You've got the time to test it, see how it works. And you're not going up against necessarily all the Vonde boats. So... Why not do something different? Okay, so they taught me through it then in a really sort of basic... Let, let, let's just very safely assume that I haven't been on an Amok 60, and what do you know, that is the case. In my head, when I see the images of these boats out in the water, and my word, they, you know, they perform foils sticking out everywhere. You arrive to it next to the, the dock... I mean, are the foils, does it just sit next to the next to the dock? Is it is it able to sort of park up in the same way that a, a 65 would? No, it's got a bit more of a, an obstacle course to get to. Um, <laughs> some specially designed fenders that uh, kind of gap out the space between the foil and the dock. So you've got to hop onto that first and then hop onto the boat. So it gets a little more high risk if you're carrying anything um, because, you you know, you're on this little wobbling fender for a little bit before you get onto the boat. But yeah, it's still still right there. It just adds to the challenge a little more. 
And then and then on board the boat, the 65s, I think, you know, it was relatively open. Deck layout, relatively open. And, you know, you guys have all said to uh, said to us, I mean, I've been on a 65 on a lovely, calm, sunny day in a harbour, but it's a wet boat. Um, so straight away when you jump on board the 60, you've got much less exposed space. It's very, very weird. For the entire transatlantic, I didn't have to put a spray top on. Like, undercover pretty much the whole time. We had 35 knots, but only one person would go out at a time. And there were a couple points where, you know, they'd put on a spray top. But, I mean, I did sail changes up front in salopettes because, you know, we were take, taking it easy during changes, getting used to everything. Sure. But for the most part, like, when you're ripping along, you're completely undercover. Uh, you've got your head sticking in a little window and you see the waves smash into it and you're just completely dry in your pyjamas, chilling out, just driving it, <laughs> foil, foiling along, big waves and staying dry, which does, is weird. Does that change the way you would sail it? I mean, I know that you guys would push it, Southern Ocean, flat water, whatever, you guys push it. But psychologically, is there a feeling of, well, we're, we're fine, we're well within safety limits? Uh, there's definitely some unnerving points, like not being able to see the waves, and it's so uncomfortable. <laughs> um, it, is, it was the most uncomfortable two weeks I've ever had on a boat. Um, I mean, leaving, I, I felt how you felt now for the first time offshore. <laughs> first two days, like literally straight out, I'm there puking up off the back. Yeah, that's me. Which I, I, I haven't had before. I don't laugh. So look, not, not to dwell on the sort of grotesque, but why, why was that? It's, it's just got a very bizarre sort of pitch and roll. Yeah, so it's a combination really of, you know, you're undercover so you can't see the horizon. So your head is pretty much at deck level because, yeah, everything's lower. So with the 65, you know, you're standing on top of the deck. So you've got a couple of meters at least of height above the waves and you can kind of see what's coming next. But with the 60, you, your head is at deck level. So not only can't you see the horizon, you also can't see the waves that are coming. So you're doing everything off of feel and numbers. Um, and you could basically be driving blind. Um, so it's kind of getting used to that. Um, but then also the way that, you know, the boat hits the waves is different because you're, even if you're not fully foiling at times, you've still got the support of the foil. So you're not slamming into the waves that you do with the 65 and that rhythmic kind of, you know, you slam into them hard, but you know when to expect it. Mm. With the 60, you're kind of skipping on top of the waves. So they're hitting further back kind of amidships. And rather than slamming into them, the waves are coming up to you. So it's kind of this heave motion rather than forward slamming. So you're there going along, you might occasionally see a wave, you expect to kind of plow forwards into it and you're bracing to go forwards and instead it's the top of your head that slams it into the cabin top. <laughs> <laughs> Which just throws everything out of balance. It's an interesting um, downside to what we've all been saying is an upside, this idea that, well, when you're in the cabin, you're you're nicely sort of undercover. But of course, as you say, yeah, you're also down below and anybody that suffers from seasickness will know don't go down below stay on the horizon um is it a motion that you you managed to get used to you know it took some reprogramming but then you knew what to expect yeah like the the seasickness definitely disappeared after a couple of days as you kind of got used to the fact that you can't see the horizon and you're yeah. going in this motion um but it, ne it definitely never got comfortable. I mean, we were all in a pretty bad state by the time we got to the other side of the Atlantic, just from <laughs> being down below. Cause you'll be there driving for a couple hours, just sending it, having a blast. Like, But you still feel all the waves that you're kind of hitting. You're like, oh, that's not going to be very nice down below. 
you go down below and you're not sleeping half the day. If you're up on the foils ripping, it's it's painful. Right. Well, let's let's talk then a little bit about down below because that that's probably one of the the biggest question marks that, that there was when the race decided we're going to go Imoka was the amount of space you take one extra crew member and obviously you need to take the water, the food, the safety provisions for those crew members. So, so everything kind of gets, gets pretty packed in quite quickly. What was your sort of first impressions between that 65, lots of different places to store and then the Imoka? Yeah, there's no space. There is, it is cosy down below. I mean, obviously it was designed for one person to be living down there. Um, and now suddenly you've got six with the OBR. Um, so like with the 65, you, everyone had you know, their bunk. Like, you shared it with obviously one other person who was on your off watch, but now there's less bunks. So uh, we had two on board, which still isn't enough because you've got only two people up on deck, so four people down below trying to sleep, yeah. two bunks. One of those is at the back of the boat, which was pretty much unusable. I mean, you'd try and sleep, but it wasn't really happening back there. Um, and then, you know, might have a bean bag further up, um, literally right next to, you know, the hatch where you enter. Like, that is a sleeping spot. So you just end up with just people everywhere, just trying to find anywhere that's comfortable, you know, people to lured, people, you know, in the bilge essentially, and, you know, the lucky person up in the bunk. Um, <laughs> although, I mean, I never managed to get a spot in the bunk, but they insisted it was no no comfier than uh, the being back on the floor. <laughs> They, they would say tell you that if you never managed to get there. I think yeah, I think you've been played. Um, one of the things with the sixty fives is um, I remember you know Scallywag made a big push to go. We're going to go less people, save the weight, um, and everybody concluded that actually on a sixty five more hands is good. You know the manoeuvres with everything. You need hands on the pumps. You need everything. So you had. Um, Obviously, we're overloading the Amokas in one sense, but the boats, as you say, are getting pushed harder. They've been uprated so that they can make use of the extra hands. Did you feel like, actually, you know what, a couple more people would be good here, or is 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 it the right number that we have at the moment sailing that boat? I don't think you could fit any more people on that boat. Um, like, it's definitely cool to have five people sailing it it really helps with the driving side I mean two hours in the nasty stuff was long enough to be steering for like it just pretty, you just burn out your concentration yeah just staring at the numbers for that long with no other kind of I mean you don't have the wind in your face or the waves in your face which as unpleasant as it is do normally wake you up a bit <laughs> while driving just like staring at the numbers you start to lose feel a bit more so i think you know we try like different combinations of how long you're driving and whether the autopilot's doing any but i think five's a good a good number for sailing it because you need that rotation and but any more and there's just no space no space in the cockpit no space down below it's like you know there's times when you know you can't sleep and you trying to come up and sit around in the cockpit and there's nowhere to sit like you've got enough space just for the two people on watch and then anyone else you know it's like oh well you can sit to leeward you can kind of sit in the hatch like everyone just kind of squeezes in um, even going from maneuver you get pretty pretty cozy pretty quickly what was what was easier then i mean we you know yes you're undercover there's that well, I'm going to be reluctant to say the word comfort now with everything else that you've described, but there's that change. Was there anything that you went, oh, wow, on a 65, that would take time and effort, and on a 60, well, two bits of string and, you know, a little bit of a pull? I mean, just moving the sails around was incredible. I can do the stack by myself. It's just so much lighter. <laughs> everything is so much lighter. All of the sails, there's, there isn't a single sail that I can't can't move on deck alone. I 
obviously they're all easier if you have two, but on the 65, like you can stare at the masthead and it's just not going to be able to do anything by yourself. You have to wait for someone else to come along. While the 60, you, know, you could have someone down below sorting the stack out down there, someone on deck doing the stack up there and the other person in the cockpit pre- prepping everything else. And it, yeah, it's a lot, a lot s- lightweight compa- compared to the 65. Um, what, about, what about sailing with the foil? Um, for most of us that have had a bit of, you know, foiling experience, it will all be dinghies. And, you know, we're used to, I mean, let's take the moth, for example, which I know you're racing at the moment. And it's that complicated, well, it's not complicated, quite clever system of auto trimming the foil based on your height and everything. And But there's a lot of dynamic trimming going on. Either you're doing it or a system's doing it. On the 60, do you put the foil out, set it, go? Do you have someone there kind of playing with it? And I also respect the fact that there might not be things that you're able to say um, for you know different teams wanting to be a little bit more secretive. But um, what, what was it like putting that foil also into the equation when you were sailing? Um, I think the best way to think of it is just like a sail with kind of the rate of how much you're trimming it. It depends on the conditions, um, what exactly, what angles you're doing. Like there's times where, I mean, it's still a learning curve and a science, I think for all the teams to just figure out, you know, how much do we want to be trimming it? How much can we just set and forget? And, you know, what's more important, you know, trimming the sails constantly or trimming the foil constantly. So, um, it was definitely something that was played around with, but, you know, you do have the option to be playing it the entire time. Um, but then, you know, it's also at the sacrifice of maybe not being able to trim the traveler as much or the main sheet as much. Um, you know, there's times when it doesn't really help playing it as much and you just kind of set it and deal with all of the other chaos that's going on. Um, but, you know, there's times where you, we were kind of like, oh, let, let's just see what happens and just try and get up and ripping and constantly playing it as you would with like a GC32 foil and things like that. So there's definitely options mm. um, about how, how you approach the foil trim, whether it's constant or set and forget um, what the right answer is. I think there needs to be a bit more testing before it comes apparent. Yeah, still plenty of room for development there, which is why I think the next few years is going to be, you know, it's going to be quite enjoyable. Um, lastly, then, for, you know, two questions, basically. Was the Ocean Race right to include the Amoka in the way that it's is it, that it's done? Do you think that the Amoka will, will, you know, is the right step? And secondly from having a sail on it and all the things that were fun and all the things that weren't, are you thinking, yeah, that's, that's a boat that I want to jump back on. Uh, the six is definitely cool. Um, and it, it's really exciting that, you know, the ocean race are involving the 60 in the next race. Personally, for me, it's the design side that just really excites me. Like the fact that it isn't, one design and you can have all these elements that you're changing and you know the boats will be different in different conditions um i think there's some things that would be a lot better if the design was opened up a little bit more and moved away from kind of the strict vendee glow by mocha 60 rules i mean the fact that you can't have any sort of foil on the rudder Mm. is huge limiting factor um, that I think would drastically change the improvement of the boat if you were to ever get the opportunity to open that one up. Um, but just the fact that you, you can have the foils and you know figure out what you want to do with sails and not be restricted is, I think, going to be really exciting for viewers to watch and just seeing where the design goes from that. Um, there's a huge learning curve available now for the Vendee sailors as well because you know, they can do something different. Um, but you know, there is still a little bit of love for the 65s, right? Yeah. <laughs> the one design racing where it is, I mean, you couldn't beat the finish last time around. So, I mean, 
I definitely, if the opportunity was to go on a 60, it would be pretty awesome way to go around the world. Um, but equally, you know, the 65 still, still good fun. Just a bit better. There you go. Keep, keep, keep your options open. Perfectly. All right, Emily, thank you very much. I know you're going to get, going to get back out in the water pretty soon. So, um, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you get on with your day. Thank you very much for that. And, uh, yeah, fingers crossed we see you out there pretty soon. Fingers crossed. <laughs>